to Bethlehem Church. Thanks. Uh, we are in a series on James called Faith Works. Thanks for your generosity. Thanks for the difference you are making in our community as we walk through week eight. This is our two month of being in this COVID-19, of being apart from you, distance from you. We're believing this is coming to an end in the next few weeks. That's just what we're believing. We'll talk about that as that goes. But the question we are asking of this series and that where you're at right there in your living room, in your kitchen, your bedroom, uh, maybe you're watching on the porch, it's a beautiful day. Maybe things are bad and you're in the pantry. I don't know, but wherever you're watching, let me ask you this. What does faithful disruption look like in a time of societal or faithful devotion look like in a time of societal disruption? Take a second. It's what we're talking about. What does it look like for us to be faithful in the midst of all that we are going through of a time of disruption where everything in the last two months has been upended, has been upended? Now, let me ask you this. How many of you, right where you're at, I want to raise your hand, you know, uh, you can, you can kind of argue amongst yourself, but how many of you remember this movie's Toy Stories? How many big Toy Story fans? Yeah, but, I mean, uh, yeah, kids movies, but they're classics. I mean, the endearing humor, just the way that it kind of, uh, the joy of the movie, the heartfelt nature of the comedy, Tom Hanks, I think it's Tim Allen, uh, classic. The, two, the first two came out before my kids were born, but we got in on Toy Story 3 and 4 and obviously went back and watched the first two. But the dynamic of the movie, and usually you're a Woody or a Buzz person. I'm more down with Woody or, or I'm more down with Buzz, and so you can debate amongst yourself who you were. But the dynamic of the first movie, which is the classic, I think it was 1995 when it came out, was Woody, Woody was Andy's favorite toy. And then Buzz Lightyear, he comes in the scene, this new fandangled, awesome, kind of super cool Buzz Spaceman Lightyear comes in. And so there's this jealousy that takes place because Andy the boy likes Buzz better. And the thing that drives Woody crazy, who's played by Tom Hanks, is that Buzz thinks he's an actual astronaut. He's an actual spaceman. Like Woody knows he's a toy. But what drives him crazy is that Buzz thinks he's an actual spaceman. And the whole time you're a toy, you're a toy, you're a toy. And Buzz laughs it off. And finally, if you know Toy Story 1, uh, there's a scene where Buzz realizes he sees a commercial of himself. Wait a second, I'm a toy. And you, he goes up to the top of the stairs and he's trying to prove to himself that he's an astronaut. He's a spaceman. So he's going to leap from one side to the next just in the music's playing. It's this unbelievable scene. It's like, whoa. And he jumps and he falls and everything goes bad. The, the confrontation of the movie was Buzz finding out he wasn't an actual spaceman but a toy. It can be crushing when you find out you're not who you thought you were. It can be crushing when you find out you're not what you thought you were. Many of us have been in situations where we realize who we thought or what we thought we were, we're not. Or we've been around people that have, have realized that, that are close to us. And sometimes it's crushing, but can I be honest with you? It's also a very freeing thing when you begin to see yourself actually as you are. You with me? James, in this epistle, in the back of the New Testament, is trying to walk people through. Believers, the little brother of Jesus, is trying to walk people through getting an accurate picture of themselves. They think they're one thing that they're not. They have a form of faith because of how they were raised in around Judaism. And James is a pastor over all Jerusalem as the church is spreading. And he's writing saying there's some of you who think you're something you're not. And so much of the book of James is that confrontation with what you think you are. In fact, for James, it was really simple. Why he writes this, what he's trying to show these people who have enough knowledge to, to look the part, but not enough knowledge to have a changed life. What he's trying to say to them is really simple, that the evidence, the evidence of salvation, church, is fruit. That the evidence of salvation in our life is the fruit, is the, the proof of salvation is the fruit our life bears. So if I'm in Christ, I'm, I'm different, and that difference is actually tangible. So I don't change to be, so, to be saved, I change because I'm saved. 
I don't obey to be accepted. I'm accepted, therefore I obey. And the disease that's affecting this church, this early church, was the simple thought that as it spread throughout Jerusalem, the movement of the church, that there was a crippling condition that separated, that, that kind of nullified their impact and, and kind of hampered their witness. And there was a, a chasm, if you will. There was a great divide. This was what was crippling this church. There was a divide between confession and deed, between theology and action, and between hearing and doing. So they, they said one thing, but their life did nothing different. They claimed to believe something in their thoughts intellectually. They assented to it, but it didn't show up in their lives. And they heard a lot, but they did very little. For James, if your belief doesn't guide what you do, then you don't believe. I had a professor one time that said, pastors, let me say it to you like this. People only believe the parts of the Bible they actually do. Think about that for a second. Isn't that good? You only believe the parts of the Bible you actually do. That's what James is saying. So let me give you an example. Let's say I'm on a skyscraper back when going to the city was cool right? Nobody goes to the city right now, but back when you could go to the big city, right? Let's say I'm on a skyscraper. I would never step off the edge of a skyscraper, the Empire State Building, if you will. I'd never step off the edge of a skyscraper because I believe in gravity. What goes up has got to come down. I just believe in it. You don't have to hype me up. I don't have to convince myself. I just believe in gravity. So unless I want to hurt myself, I'm not stepping off the edge of a skyscraper, because I believe in the law of gravity. But sometimes in churches, what I've found is that we forget that our actions are always predicated by our perceptions or our beliefs. So what we do is try to convince people to think the right thing, but they don't actually believe it. So you'll see somebody say, I believe the word of God. I believe the Bible. Yet the Bible says it's more blessed to give than to receive. Yet they never give. So do they actually believe? Come on. Right? We do that. Oh, man, I believe about truth right here, brother. You tell it, preacher. Although the Bible says it's more blessed to give than to receive, but they never give, yet they say they believe the Bible. Come on. Because what you find out is there's actually a mental map that we make choices off, and what we believe guides that map, guides our perceptions, and it shows up in our actions. That's all James is saying. So the Bible says, love your neighbor as yourself, but when the dude treats his wife like a jerk, when a husband treats her life like a jerk, Right? Does he really love his neighbor as himself, even though he affirms it? Or love your neighbor as yourself, and all they do is gossip and slander. They really love their neighbor. See, your belief shows up in your action. It's not it's one thing to affirm. It's another thing to do. Paul says this in Galatians. He says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against those things, there's no law. So the, you know, there, there's a fruit of the Spirit. And what James is saying is this fruit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. What James is saying is let me tell you what that fruit looks like. That's all he's saying. Here's what it shows up in your life. And so in this pandemic, let's get real specific. Because we've all been in a mode of response the last two months. Responding emotionally, responding relationally, responding to the news of the day, responding to our disorientation. We've been responding. And I want you to see in James 1, he talks about the response of believers to life events. And look at what he says, verse 19. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Underline that if you get your scriptures out. Quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man doesn't produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all the filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. The implanted word, Christ in us, the hope of glory. All right, so for those in Christ, think about it. Isn't life all a response, no matter how much we try to be proactive? You know proactive, set New Year's resolutions, live by our values, make choices before they happen. All right, we have the, we're going to be proactive. I'm not just going to, but most of life, let's just be honest, is a reaction. Reacting to the relationships in our life, reacting to the events of the day, reacting to the news of the day. And in that, what James is saying is those of us who are believers, our response looks different to life events, to relational events. There's a marked difference. 
And here's the language he uses. We're quick to hear, we're slow to speak, and we're slow to become angry. Because the implanted word, Christ in us, we have a different response. Because we believe it affects our actions. Do you see it? Because we believe it affects the way we act and respond. And so we're quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. So look at me right here. But let's be honest about our culture for a second. I mean, let's just look at the last two months. Are we not all slow to hear, quick to speak, and easily irritated? Is this not a great descriptor of the time in which we live? We're quick to give our two cents. We got freedom of speech, man, and we got social media, and so that gives us a platform to let everybody know our opinions, and everybody should know our opinions because we got freedom of speech. Come on. Quick to, uh, we're slow. We're, we're quick to speak, but we're slow to hear. And do you realize now that the last 10 years what's changed in our society is we only hear what we want to hear? We only select the playlist on Spotify of the music we want to hear. We only listen to the podcast we want to listen to. We only turn on the news that agrees with what we already think. So we're, we're, we're quick to speak, let everybody know our opinion, we're slow to hear, and we only hear what we want to hear, and so guess what that makes us? Easily irritated. Easily irritated. So let's just take the last, come on, we're going to talk for a second. Let's just take the last eight weeks, the pandemic, and let's just look at people's responses. Speak first, listen second. Are you with me? And by the way, we listen to very little accurate information. Speak first, listen second, and we're always irritated with somebody. So this pandemic, when it first happened, I don't know which camp you were in, but there were a lot of people that were just like, are you kidding me? Just perturbed by the news. I mean, come on. Are you kidding me? This is so overblown. And then there were people who were really fearful. There were people who were full of angst. There were people full of worry, people full of fear. And so the people full of fear, the people full of worry, they looked at these people who didn't care and they go, you're heartless. And the people who like, this is so overblown, this is a conspiracy, this is so blown out of proportion, they looked at the people who were fearful and go, you're cowards. Make quick judgments. So then you get going in this pandemic. Now we're in the spot where things are beginning to open back up. Tell me this is not the truth. You got people going, boy, we got to open up the economy. So our governor here locally, we began a week ago, opened up the economy, slow roll back in. And there are people going, we got to do this. We got to economically do this. And there are other people who are a little nervous and they're like, man, we got to keep socially distanced. So the people who want to economically open everything up, look at the people who are still crying for social distance and then kind of going, hey man, we need a social distance. go, you're weak. You're being manipulated. And then the people over here who want to open up the economy, we go, you're heartless. You don't care about people. We're quick to judge. We just own it. I'm, I'm, man, I'm talking this morning. Then you watch as we begin to reacclimate over the next few weeks. There'll be people who wear masks. They're a little nervous getting out. And then there'll be people who just rip roaring to go and they're looking to give everybody a hug. Easy, bro. You know? And we'll make judgments about those people. Why? Because we are quick to judge. We're quick to speak and nobody listens to anybody anymore. What James is saying is there's a response that the people of God have, and it looks different than the world. I want to say that again, because I am talking to some of you, Bethlehem Church. There's a response our culture has, and there's a response that those in Christ have. James is the little brother of Jesus. You remember that. And he was a skeptic most of Jesus' ministry. In fact, all of Jesus' ministry. He heard Jesus making the claims he was the Son of God. He heard Jesus' teaching, but he was a skeptic. What convinced him was the resurrection. But we only get a snapshot in the Gospels of Jesus' life. James saw it up front. It was his little brother. And probably the hallmark of Jesus' teaching, you see this in the Gospels, comes in Mark chapter 12. That wraps up all of Jesus' teaching. Somebody comes up to Jesus and says, what's the most important commandment? What's the most important commandment? Look at this, Mark 12. Probably my favorite passage of Scripture that directs my life. The most important is this. Of all the commandments, what's the most important? Here it is. The most important is this. Say it with me. If you're reading with me. Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. You've heard this. With all your soul, with all your mind. We've taught it here before. And with all your strength. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So here's what James knew. Jesus taught that time and time again. Love God, love people. 
So fundamentally, the centerpiece of, people, of, of men and women of faith, the centerpiece is we are others-centered. Love for God and love for people. So let me say it again. The centerpiece of our faith that drives our response, love for God, love for people, we are others-centered. So when we are quick to hear, when we are slow to speak, and when we are slow to become angry, that is an other-centered response. Quick to hear, slow to speak, and, and slow to become angry. Other-centered. We're thinking of the other person. We're empathy. We're putting our faith in God and responding as we are others-centered. But, listen to me, when we are slow to hear, the opposite, quick to speak, and easily irritated, that is self-centered. We're only thinking about ourselves and how we feel. You can be self-centered or you can be other-centered. But Bethlehem Church, look at me right here. You cannot be both. James, in his non-highly philosophical way, in his straightforward way, here's what he's saying. If you have faith that believes that, that, that changes you, and that is seen in the way you respond to people, to circumstances, and situations. Quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to become angry is because I think of others, because I'm other centered in my faith, centered on God and my belief in Him, and centered on other people because other people I value. But when I am slow to hear, when I am quick to speak, and when I'm easily irritated, the root of that, look at me right here, is because you are self centered. You are self centered. And here's what James is saying there's a marked difference if you're taking notes. In the way we, as people of Christ, who have the implanted words, the way James uses it, in us, well, there's a marked difference between the way the people of faith respond to life events. We just respond differently. Now, as your pastor, we try to lead that way in this season. What do you mean? We try to lead others centered. Think of not the good of Bethlehem Church, but think of serving our community, serving our nation, serving our state, serving our globe, if you will, in this season. Look out. I've told you guys that our posture early on has been not how does this affect us, but how can we help? That's all we've said because we want to be other-centered. So one of the questions we are beginning to continually get, which is a good question, is when are we going to come back? And what's driving us is we are trying to be other-centered in this comeback because trust me, I can't wait for you to get back. I can't wait for you guys to be back with us on all of our campuses, man. I mean, it's like, yes. And we believe we're getting closer and closer to that, but what's driving our decision-making? We're trying to be other centered. So I wanted to get real clear with you of what's leading my decision-making, our elder board's decision-making in this season. I don't have this in your notes, but this is just kind of a, a picture that kind of helps me get my head straight with being other centered in the decision making when to come back from the coronavirus, from the COVID 19 pandemic. So, for us, if you think about it, we are people of God first. And so, when we're trying to make a decision, we're trying to lean into God's spirit. And by God's spirit, God's direction, we want to walk in the spirit love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self control guides us. And we want to walk in the spirit. We want to keep walking in the spirit. We do that by staying humble and trying to lean in and listen to God, follow his direction, and be people that walk in humility, not in our flesh. That's first and foremost. God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. Second, we're, we're trying to be good citizens as well, local and state officials. Now, let me just say this for the record. This is not an issue of separation of church and state. It's not an issue there. This is an issue in this season of us trying to walk with wisdom and influence and love our neighbor as ourselves and think of others first. We've been through a pandemic the last two months we're a church of influence, which means a church with a lot of people. So we're trying to walk and be an example in this as well. So we're asking local and state officials, just like you're watching, governor, man, our city officials, our local officials, doctors, nurses, we have constant conversation with people right now because we want to be good citizens and walk in that and walk in humility. And then here's the other part. We want to hear from you. We want, we want to, in, in your life over the last few weeks, how are things? How are you emotionally? How are you spiritually? But then as we begin to plan, 
We want to plan with you and your response in mind because we're, we're with you in this. We don't have a seat that you don't have in this. I have a different responsibility as a leader of the church, but we're with you in this, so we want to hear back. So in fact, Pastor Matt and Angela brought this up at the beginning. We are doing a survey today. And this actually shows up right here. Right now, if you text 97,000, text BC Survey to 97,000, as soon as my talk's done, we want everybody to fill this out. And it's about four to six, four to six minutes it takes you. And it just gives us your response of what's going on in you and through you. But as we begin to look to come back, man, where you're at in this process is anonymous I'm not coming to your house going, I can't believe you said that. No, we just want to hear back from you. We love you. We're with you. We are trying to be other-centered in this. Trusting God, following our local and state officials. Leave that survey up for a second. Take the BC survey, 97,000, leaning into our people, your wisdom. And here's what we think. In the midst of all of this is where wisdom comes. Week one, if any of you lacks wisdom, ask for it. And God will give it generously. And God will give it generously. Now, takes that. Don't fill it out while I'm talking, right? I don't know if you are. Please don't. Give me the five minutes and I'm done with you, okay? Not done with you, but done for this moment, uh, if you will. But l- let's keep on looking what, Jesus, uh, what James says, uh, verse 22. Be doers of the word. And not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone's a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Now, I'm not sure this is popular anymore. But when I remember in college, you could take courses that you could, you could audit a course. A-U-D-I-T, audit a course. And what that meant was you could sit in and get the information from the professor, get the content of the course. You could even have access to the professor or the teacher, but you didn't have to do any of the work. You were auditing. You were getting the information. You didn't have to turn any assignments. Uh, you didn't have to take any tests. Right? There were no deadlines. You, you, you sat in and audited the course. You got to pass or fail based on you just being present. Now, for some, uh, they still do it. I think that you still audit the course, but like freshmen, many times in, in, on college campuses or freshman orientation class, that's required. You got to be there for your first semester once a week. And you go and you learn what it means to be a freshman. Not that you didn't know, but they're going to tell you, and you sit there and you listen. You get the information, you get the content, but there's no test, there's no grades, there's no assignments. It's just pass or fail based on your attendance and your presence. When you audit a course, you're not engaging in anything. All you're doing is sitting there getting content. Nodding your head and you can say, been there, done that. As clear as I can be, when James right here says, you are a doer of the word, not a hearer, here's what he's saying. The Christian faith isn't something you audit. The Christian faith isn't something you say, oh, been there, done that, check the box. It's something that we daily live out. It's not something that we get tons of knowledge and go, man, got it, good, no. It's something that we daily apply. See, what hearers do, I want you to listen to me, hearers affirm the word. He says, don't be a hearer, be a doer. Hearers affirm the word. What do you mean? Yeah, I agree with that. I've been in the South for a long time, so I've been a lot around a lot of hearers. Whoo, I'm just, I'm a, I'm a person, I mean, I believe the Bible. I believe what that pastor says. All right, I'm a person of values. I believe it all. Yeah, that's right. That's what God says. That's right. The Bible's truth. I believe all of it. All you're doing right there is affirming that you hear. What doers do is they realize it's not simply enough to hear the word, but that, and that puts you in some type of uh, special favor with God because you hear the word and affirm it. It's not what one knows, but it's what one does, puts into practice that counts. That's what James is saying. It's not what one knows, but one does. The call to do what it says is a call to put our faith into practice. It's a daily thing. That is the centerpiece of James's life. And so it shows up in our response in this season. Quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to be irritated. Because we're the people of God. Our response is different. But I love this right here. This one little phrase, I've taught this passage before in the past, but I've always missed this phrase. Being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, 
He will be blessed in his doing. So let me give you these two things. What James is saying is hearing the word is the beginning. It sets the direction. Hearing the word sets the direction. If you're taking notes, when we hear the word, whether the teaching of God's word, whether in our daily time with God, whether we're driving down the road listening to a worship tune on Spotify or listening to our latest worship playlist, when we're hearing the word, that is the beginning. That is setting the direction for our life, whether it's the teaching of God's word, whether it's reading God's word, whether it's worshiping with God's word, whatever it is, whatever we do, that sets the direction. But listen to me. Here's what James is saying. But doing the word is actually what brings the blessing. Doing the words actually what brings the full life isn't knowledge of, oh, I agree with what that guy said. It's when we begin to put it into action. Oh, I agree with what she said. No, no. It's when we begin to put it into action. It's the truth that we experience. So let me give you some examples. Difference between here and doer. The New Testament is full of a bunch of one another statements. Jesus began teaching it that the way that we respond to each other relationally is the mark of believers. And so Jesus started teaching these one another principles, and and, and Paul takes them and elaborates on them. That the mark of somebody who has Christ in them is their relational reality is different than somebody who doesn't. So let me say this. Somebody who follows Jesus, their relationship reality is different. So let me give you a couple of the one another verses I'm talking about. So Jesus teaches, love the Lord your God, or excuse me, a new command I give to you that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another, John 13. By this, all people will know that you're my disciples if you love for one another. There it is, love for one another. So here's what the hearer does. That's right, man. Love is the way. Jesus is love. I'm about love. Our church is about love. Love wins in the end. It's all about love. Why can't we all just love? All you've done there is affirm what I just said. Mm Mm-hmm. That's right. That's an affirmer. Love. Love. What a doer, what they begin is they see that, that love one another is a directive for their faith. So here's what that means. They're willing to set down their rights, their place, their position for the sake of someone else because that's what Jesus did for us. What do you mean? They're willing in moments to listen to what you're saying because they love you and their calls to love, which means they're willing to take a back seat. I'm willing, listen to me right here, for my preferences and my opinions to take a back seat so I can hear from you. Why? Because I love you. Here's love. Don't do anything. Run their mouth and blab like everybody else. Doers, no. I don't have to say something here. I can listen. I'm going to sit down and in this moment listen because I love. I don't, my preference, my opinion, I love you and I'm willing to take a back seat because that's what Jesus did for me. He lowered himself for me. That's what love is. There's a difference. Let me give you another one. Paul says this, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. So here's what a hearer does. And that's right. We just need to help each other out. Christians need to lend a hand. That's what what we need to do. That's what my church does. My church lends a hand. We should help other people. That's what we should do. Everything you just did was affirm what was right. No doubt about it, but that's just being a hearer. Hearers affirm. Mm Mm-hmm. It's right. He's true. Talk, 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 talk. Doers know that when Scripture says bear one another's difference, that we don't only feel bad for people from a distance, but we draw close to them to the point of asking, how can I help? See, what doers, what, what they begin, somebody who does the word, is they carry a load that's not theirs to carry, and they're willing to do it because they want to bear somebody else's burdens. That's the difference. Affirm. That's right, man. We need to help other people. That's right. We need to love those less fortunate. Doers. Actually choose to carry somebody else's load that's not theirs to carry. They actually don't just feel for you from a distance. They get up and they bend the knee and they go, how can I help? How can I pray? That's what a doer does. Look at what Paul says again. Be kind to one another. Tenderhearted. Forgiving one another. Isn't that interesting? You can do a fascinating study in your own time. All the one another statements. 
forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Here's what a hearer does, bro. People just need to be kind to one another. They need to forgive one another. We just all need to get along. Can't we just hug? And we all nod. That's right. That's right. Here's what doers do. In this season, I'm going to be quick to forgive my spouse, to forgive my kids, to forgive my husband, to forgive my wife, because I know they're probably feeling the way I'm feeling. And so I'm going to be quick to forgive because I know I'm going to need forgiveness at some point. Come on. That's the difference. It's the willingness in this season to give people the benefit of the doubt. All James is saying is our response because of the implanted word, Christ in us, has to be different from the world's. If not, we are what Paul says, a clanging gong and a resounding cymbal. We talk and we talk and we talk, making these claims, and there's no difference between us and the world. Our response has to be different. Not just affirm, I'm a person of the word. All about love, all about freedom. Talk, 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 talk. It's exhausting. What a doer does is they begin to apply it. And they begin to know it gets in the nitty gritty. So in this season, as we begin to come back in this backside of the pandemic, where all of you are emotionally afraid, where everybody's tired and exhausted, can I just say this? We have to be different, Bethlehem Church. We have to put our view on others. We've got to be others-centered. James uses the illustration as we close of a hearer. And here's what he says. A hearer is someone who looks in a mirror. You probably hadn't done that yet this morning because you're still in your PJs. But a hearer is someone who looks in the mirror. And they look and go, boy, I need to change that. I need to shave. I need to put on some makeup. I, before I go out, I, there, look, I see the mirror and I know what it tells me. I got to make some modifications here. What a hearer does is look in the mirror, sees what's wrong and walks away and does nothing. That's what James says a hearer is. Isn't that good? That's what he says it is. So James is saying the word of God, God's truth is a mirror to our soul. It points out when we're just hearing and not doing. When, when we're affirming the word, and aff- but not applying. So here's what I want to say to you. Here's what else I found as we close. What else I found. Not only is the word a mirror, but adversity is a mirror. This last eight weeks has revealed who many of us are. My question is, are you good with that? For some of us, this last eight weeks, we realized, wait a second, we, we are who we thought we were. We're people of faith and we found our strength and we found our dependence. For others of us, and this is a little uncomfortable, people around us have realized what we claim we are and we're actually not. Because not only does the word give a mirror, but adversity is a mirror. And we've been walking through a season of adversity. See, maybe the question of the pandemic is simply this. Who am I becoming during this pandemic? Am I who I say I am? Is my faith and my response different than the rest of the world? When everybody else is driven by emotion and frustration, I'm driven by faith. When everybody else is self-centered in their response, I'm driven others-centered in my response. Love for God, love, who are you? All type of wisdom is extracted from adversity. And maybe that's the most important question God's been trying to build in us this season. What does my response tell me about who I am? And maybe some of us watching, you've never received Christ. Maybe some of us watching are religious. Maybe some of us watching have some knowledge, but there's never been a relationship that's begun. Scripture says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And, and, and that when we confess with our mouth that we sin, that we mess up, we screw up, then we are saved. It's an act of belief and repentance that Christ came, 
He died and then he rose again. And what convinced James was that Jesus rose again and that you and I's faith rests on the fact that our Jesus is alive and well. And maybe right where you're at, I can lead you right where you're at. So I, there's never been a moment of faith in my life. I'm just going to leave this up for a moment. This is just me putting words. What does it mean to be saved? What does it mean to follow Jesus? Prayer doesn't save you. It's the posture of your heart. And maybe right where you're at, the, the, just where you're at. Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner and I've screwed up. I got a lot of religion. I can't save myself. I got a head knowledge, but it's, I've never been changed. My response is no different right? I confess my complete helplessness to forgive my own sin. I can't get myself into heaven. In this moment, I trust you alone for the forgiveness of my sin. I believe you died on the cross, you rose again, and you defeated the consequence of sin once and for all. I'm placing my trust in you. I choose to follow you. Right there, just say, thank you for saving me. If you prayed that, and I'm going to leave this up for a moment, we would love just to send you some encouragement. I would love just to reach out to you and let you know we're with you and we're for you. You right now just text in Christ to 97,000. The, the book of James is written to the believers, but I wanted to open up because I know there's a whole lot of people watching that are still on the fence. You text in Christ to 97,000. Can I pray over you, church? That our response would be different. Doers, not hearers. We would be different people. The difference in us would we were people that don't only affirm the word, we apply the word. Who am I becoming in this pandemic? I just want to let you sit on that. Husband, wife, as the band comes, who am I becoming in this pandemic? Who am I becoming in this pandemic? Am I who I thought I was? Am I a person of patience? Or am I a person of frustration? Am I quick to speak and slow to hear? Or am I slow to speak and quick to hear? We all want to be heard. All of us know everything. Why don't people just listen to us? That's our culture and it's nasty. It's our culture and it's toxic. And I think it's interesting when the people of God follow in that going, oh man, come on. Who am I becoming in this pandemic? When we don't see it, you work. When we don't feel it, you work. We're going to worship you in this season.